they launched at the worst possible time, just as the pandemic started to sweep across the world. However, I was one of the few fortunate people to spend time and actually get to stay on their first ship, Scarlet Lady, before lockdown. I'm Gary Bembridge, this is another of my tips for travellers. I want to share with you what I discovered and what you need to think about before you even consider booking a cruise on this line, including if one of the big design flaws could mean they are a no-go. So what do you need to consider? It's new and untried, which will inevitably mean some or many things will not work. This of course makes it exciting if you want to take some risk or be adventurous with your cruise plans. That certainly appeals to me. Although headed by a very experienced cruise CEO, Tom McAlpine, ex of Disney Cruise Lines, many, many of the people involved are new to cruising, including much of the leadership team and the designers. This definitely shows in some areas which do not feel that practical cruising wise, like certain aspects of the cabins, which I will talk about later. There will be adaptations and there will be changes based on who finally cruises, what they use, what they like, what they don't like, and what they are demanding that's not there. But if you want to be part of that changing experience, then definitely consider them. It certainly appeals to me from that perspective. These are new ships with a new approach, although in practice, not as much as some have argued in my personal view. Firstly, it's more around the look and feel. The exterior looks very different. The interiors are more like a trendy hipster hotel than other ships for sure. Secondly, the way they provide services. So there's no main dining room, for example, just a myriad of alternative venues. And thirdly, their focus is very much on music-based partying on and off the ship. So they have the Bimini Beach Club in the Bahamas, their partnerships with DJ producers like Mark Ronson. If it helps, they describe the ships as rebellious lux. No, it didn't help me either. That didn't help me at all. But I have also heard them say casual sophistication, which from what I saw is a good description of what they do. So if that appeals to you, then definitely consider them. One of the key appeals for me anyway, is they are adults only. You have to be over 18. Although if you're 18 to 20, you can only come on board with at least an adult, one adult over 21. Early on, Virgin Voyages seemed to be implying that their core was the millennial generation, but they now talk about being for the young at heart from 18 to 80, and especially people who have not thought cruising was for them. You've got to remember, Richard Branson is well into his 70s and has never cruised before. We will not know until the line has been selling for a while who really comes on board and how that settles down age-wise. I think it will have a hefty amount of the older crowd of cruisers like me, aged from 45 and upwards, I'm in my 60s, simply because like me, they are the ones who cruise a lot, have the money to take some risk to try new lines, prepare to take the risk, and of course have grown up with the Virgin brand. It's a brand we know and love. Also, as I discuss more later, this is not a value or budget line. It's a much more premium offer. And I think younger cruisers may actually be drawn into the value lines in the end. But if you're on the older age spectrum like me, I don't think you should reject them for that reason alone. I don't think it's just going to be about young people. One thing that may be a no-go for you though, is it's not for those looking for an educational or enrichment style cruise with immersive historic ports of call. They're much more around having a good time drinking, dancing, and so on, and calling on popular, well-trodden tourist ports. The itineraries on offer in both the Caribbean and the Mediterranean are limited, and they repeat the same itineraries across the season. In the Caribbean, Scarlet Lady has three key itineraries out of Miami. They're four or five days long. They include uh, Mayan Sol, basically Costa Maya, Dominican Days, which goes to Puerto Plata, and Fire and Soiree, which is going on to Key West. All spend a day then at their private beach club at Bimini in the Bahamas. In the Mediterranean, Valiant Lady also has three key itineraries, and these are out of Barcelona. They're seven nights. They're French days, which includes French ports like Marseille, Monte Carlo, Spanish Obsession, Spanish ports obviously, and Irresistibly Mediterranean, which is a mix of both Spanish and French ports. Now, all of these cruisers spend time overnight on the party island of Ibiza. One of the most hyped features of the ship by the line were the cabins. However, the cabins will definitely not be to everyone's taste, but they are something different and are distinctive. You certainly will not get them confused with other cruise ship cabins at all. The regular cabins have what are called seabeds. These beds, they turn into couches during the day in like an L shape. Now a skeptic could argue that this is designed to make the cabins, which are quite small, 
feel more spacious, but on the plus side, they do mean more room in the day. Not great if you want to nap before a hard night of parting because it's a bit cumbersome to make the bed up. I did though find them comfortable once made into a bed. There's also a hammock on the balcony, which is fun. The bathroom it looks great. It's fairly small and cramped. I didn't mind it. I thought it was fine, but others on the ship with me were less keen. So the bathrooms again are going to be a bit hated, love it. There's definitely less storage than other ship cabins because you can't store cases under the bed. Overall, I quite like the cabins though. I did actually struggle to find the light switch tip. It's in the open front of cupboard. It's not easily spotted at first and it's just sort of behind the door. There are 78 Rockstar suites of varying sizes. They look fantastic. And all the suites have access to Richard's rooftop area, a suite only access area, which really is great. When it comes to dining, if you love buffets and have been put off Virgin Voyages by the reported lack of a buffet, don't be. There is really a buffet, but on the plus side, it's more like a food court than a traditional buffet. And so already was more COVID protocol ready. It's called the galley and has a series of themed food stations or outlets, much as a food court or food hall does. I liked that there wasn't a main dining room without assigned tables set times. I'm not a big fan of main dining rooms, often partly because I cruise solo quite a lot and I tend to avoid going there for, so I feel like I'm wasting money. There are 20 included restaurants in the fair no paid for extra specialty dining on costs. It includes things like Wake, which is steak and seafood, Razzle Dazzle, which is a sort of a vegetarian. It has a drag uh, brunch, Test Kitchen, which is a lab, come restaurant. They have a Korean barbecue. They have a Mexican street food and right through to the pizza place if you just want a pizza. So a nice range, all included. If you like the formality and process of the main dining room, this line's not for you as every night you'll have to choose and book a different venue to eat in. The different approach to entertainment is actually very refreshing, but it's definitely not going to please you if you love those themed song and dance shows that are so prevalent on cruise lines today. Personally, I find them all so similar and I really liked the new fresh approach on Virgin Voyages. They have the Red Room, which is a huge space and it can be configured in all sorts of formats. I saw an acrobatic dance show where the seats were on either side of the room and the show was in the middle. Then later that evening had been turned into a large open space where the audience stood and the dancers performed around us on a ramp on a stage and on sort of boxes. It's quite experimental, it's quite different, but if you're looking for something out of the ordinary in the evening entertainment, then Virgin will definitely please you. And so it's definitely worth considering for that reason. The other venue of note is The Manor. It's a multi-level nightclub venue. It's named after Richard Branson's first recording studio. It's a great space, great music, and great light effects, and it's a really big booming hub. There's a huge choice of bars, including things like Draft House, brewed beers, and a champagne bar, but pretty much it's the same as another large ships. It's not that different in terms of choice, but you know, it's very high in design and look. The fares are on the pricier side, certainly on the surface. This is not a value line offer. And when comparing fares before you reject them, look at what is included when comparing fares. Their fare includes all the dining options, as I've mentioned. It includes all the gratuities, Wi-Fi fitness classes, filtered water, sodas. It excludes alcoholic drinks, specialty coffees and short excursions. So there could be quite a lot of on cost still. You will definitely find cheaper cruises in the Caribbean and the Mediterranean on lines like Norwegian and Royal Caribbean. But if you're looking for a more premium line experience with more bundled in, you might find the total cost of your cruise is not that different as it first appears. So compare carefully before rejecting just on the headline fare. Sign up for the emails as there are often deals and offers I'm seeing. The swimming pool is ridiculously small, but the fitness offers and gyms are massive and extensive. I'm not sure what the designers were thinking when it came to the swimming pool. There are very few or no sea days on their cruises, and so the size of the pool may not be a deal breaker for you. But if you love hanging out around the pool, taking a dip, then look carefully at the pool before booking because you may actually be disappointed. Personally, I think some of the headline grabbing gimmicks seem to be trying a bit too hard, but they are fun. Uh, not sure if they'll survive, but they do add to the fun. So you've got things like the tattoo parlor, which is squid ink. And bearing in mind, in my experience, you can't get a new tattoo wet and you're cruising the Caribbean or somewhere in the Med and will want to swim. So I'm not quite sure how that's going to work and if that'll survive. There's also a Voyage vinyl record shop, which I guess is more about building the brand than selling records. It doesn't really matter if some of these gimmicks don't work because they are a novelty to check out at least and they don't really add to your costs. Taking all of this into account, what did I do? Well, I've actually booked 
to cruise on both Scarlet Lady in the Caribbean and Valiant Lady in the Mediterranean, I think it's going to be interesting enough, even with some of those concerns and watch outs that I've covered. I think it's worth getting on board, trying them out. I think the Caribbean and Med cruises will be quite different, not just because the passengers will be different. You know, there'll be fewer Europeans are likely to travel to Miami for four or five night cruises, but also the length and the port mix, I think, in the Mediterranean will attract different types of people. So I do think it was worth finding out and being adventurous. And I decided on balance to give it a go. And I'm going on both ships in those two different regions. What do you think about Virgin Voyages based on this? Is it a line you will book when you head out cruising again? Remember, I have loads more episodes of cruise tips, advice and updates.